Good morning, everyone. This is the Data Science Seminar, and today it's my pleasure to host also a joint event with Heidelberg AI. And we have a speaker, it's Fred Hambrecht today, and very welcome. And I hand over to Lena Meyer-Hein for a short introduction. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to have uh, Fred Hambrecht here. He's a professor at the University of Heidelberg, uh, who's actually been working in the field of machine learning long before it became a hype. <laughs> Um, to my surprise, I only learned this now, uh, he originally studied chemistry at the ETH Zurich. Uh, he also spent some time abroad in various places, Lausanne, Cambridge, London, Boston. Uh, and very impressively, in 2002, he actually became, if I'm correctly informed, the youngest professor at the age of 26 at the oldest German university, uh, um, Heidelberg. He's also founder of the Heidelberg Collaborator for Image Processing, HTE, and I really enjoyed reading his bio sketch, which says, Fred is a professor at the Heidelberg University, still thinks of science as the greatest profession on earth. That's very motivating, and in this spirit, uh, the stage is yours. Wow, well, thanks very much, Elena at all. Um, I, I really like the, the series. I've listened to a few very good talks here, so it's nice. Uh, to be able to share with our own work. Um, actually, this is um, uh, so, you know, as scientific endeavors go, um, this is now, I would say, a pretty mature one. Uh, we started in this uh, around, depending on what you count, 2007, eight. I realized uh, this morning, you know, this when many of uh, people in the audience probably were in high school. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, for example, um, Björn Andres was one of the really important um, early figures in this. And uh, well, today I want to, um, I have two things to relate. So, so one is I want to talk about sign graphs. What are they? How are they useful in computer vision uh, in general? And uh, then um, how can we partition them efficiently? And uh, for the second part, I will mostly present a recent work uh, by Alberto Bailoni, who's going to defend his PhD soon. Um, so, uh, let's fix uh, terminology first. Um, this is a kind of image uh, that we deal with often. Um, so, some blurry, you know, microscopy image of, of a few cells. And there are different kinds of questions uh, you can ask from that kind of image. Uh, you may want to know which pixel is foreground or background. Um, that would, oh, and I have not shared screen. Uh, that uh, doesn't help. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, sorry about this. Um, and you can, you see some cells? Great. Yes. Okay, good. So a couple of cells, uh, we can either ask for each cell, you know, is it a foreground background? That's what in this talk uh, I call semantic segmentation. Um, or we can ask, uh, well, which cell or which pixels foreground the background, and in addition, uh, which uh, pixels belong to one entity, that would be semantic instant segmentation. And finally, um, there's pure instant segmentation or image partitioning, where we just ask uh, which pixels belong to the same entity. Yeah. So uh, with that in mind, um, Let's see if we can, you know, map these uh, problems to these terms. So um, the bottom one is an image from the famous uh, cityscapes uh, benchmark, where, um, well, you see, we uh, delineate individual people here, and we somehow separate them from cards, uh, which are also delineated one from the other. Or um, there is a problem here, uh, digital pathology, problem where we want to find out which regions uh, belong to tumor, which ones do not. Or here, a uh, problem I will talk a lot about today, um, where we try and decide which pixels belong to the same cell. Um, now, which is which? My question to you. And um, so the cityscapes here, this would be an example of semantic instance segmentation, because we try and distinguish between pedestrians and cars, but also between one pedestrian and the next. Um, this one here, tumor or not, would be an example of semantic instant segmentation. And this one, finally, um, of most interest today in the second half of talk, will be image partitioning. 
All right. And uh, I want to argue that all of these can be modeled as instances of signed graph partitioning. And um, for something like semantic instance segmentation in particular, there are like two broad schools of thought and uh, you know tens of thousands of papers written, but essentially all can be mapped to one of the two schools. Uh, one school would be to um, first detect and then figure out which pixels exactly belong to one instance. So first detect means we would first, you know, put a bounding box or put a blob inside each of these cells and then try and find out, you know, what exactly is its spatial extent. And this other approach uh, that uh, I will follow today um, works without a prior detection step. So we directly somehow group pixels or super pixels into resulting objects. All right, but now comes uh, you know tutorial dash lecture part, and this is the image I will use. You know, model six pixels, but easy for me to draw. And I want to explain what this has to do with uh, graphs and cuts and with sine graphs and what is a sine graph in, in the first place. All right. So let's look at semantic instance segmentation. If I just want to distinguish between two classes, and then in your mind you can um, connect each pixel. Um, to one of these two special nodes. Um, so there's one for the, what is this purple class? And there is one node for the green class. And then we can have a classifier um, that tells us how strongly we associate each pixel with each node. Yeah, so typically this would be a neural network, which tells you that, uh, you know, with a strength of two, it believes that this pixel be, uh, belongs here. And with a strength of four, it believes uh, this um, this pixel belongs to the blue class. And with the strength of only one, it belongs that this pixel belongs to the green class. And we, we can do that for all pixels uh, because that's a mess. You know, let's just uh, concentrate on these two here. Well, and then uh, there's not, you, do, you don't need much algorithm uh, to make that kind of decision. Uh, you just ask which belief is stronger and then you assign the pixel to that meta node. Yeah, so, uh, you know, sorry for starting very basic. Um, I think it'll get more complicated in a moment. So here, well, this pixel, it more strongly believes to belong to the green class than to the blue. And uh, so I make this decision on a pixel by pixel level. Now, if you do this on a pixel by pixel level, depending on how good your neural network is um, in semantic and segmentation, the result may or may not, may not look noisy. So perhaps sometimes you want to explicitly couple these decisions. Um, that's not something uh, that uh, one would do, I think, in 2021. But it's uh, something that was uh, important for a long time in computer vision. So if we introduce these extra edges here, um, which we would need to cut and, whose, and the cost of cutting them we would consider, that would be a mark of random field. And uh, as long as I have only um, two terminal nodes, and as long as all edges are zero or have positive weight, then I can solve this efficiently um, using, efficiently and exactly using an algorithm called ST min cut or, or graph cut. Um, now, sometimes uh, I may have evidence that, uh, you know, these two pixels probably belong to the same class. So I make some of these edges stronger than others. In that case, that would be a conditional random field and it is uh, not any harder to solve. Um, as soon as you have more than two classes, um, the problem uh, will be called a multi-way cut problem or multi-terminal cut problem. And even with only attractive interactions, you know, already at this point, um, this becomes an NP-hard problem. And there are good approximate algorithms uh, that one can use to solve it, but uh, you cannot do this exactly except under very special circumstances uh, that I don't want to discuss here in detail. Um, so that would be semantic multi-class segmentation. Now, if we remember this uh, pedestrians and cars example, um, for example, if these two pixels here, um, they belong to different pedestrians, well, this kind of approach could only tell you, as long as we only have attractive edges, that both pixels are pedestrian, but we cannot model that you know, one pedestrian ends and the next one starts. To do this, we actually need repulsive edges. 
So we need uh, edges in our graph with negative edge weights, because in that case, we can say, all right, there's one instance of the blue class, and another instance of the blue class, and uh, here some other class. But importantly, we can now start delineating objects from each other, even if they belong to the same class, like two pedestrians that overlap or two cars that overlap in the image. So um, these repulsive edges, they are fundamentally important. Yeah? Without them, you cannot have instance segmentation at all. All right. Now, um, if uh, you remember this problem where we don't have semantics, so pure image partitioning or pure instance segmentation, in that case, these extra nodes, they don't have informative edge weights. Um, these edges are all of the same cost. And uh, then I can just as well omit them. I can uh, you know, concentrate on the simple model here on, on the right-hand side. And uh, this is actually a problem that I'm interested in. And uh, this is called, uh, or can be modeled as a multi cut collision clustering problem. Um, why have I been interested in this uh, for a long time? Because it happens to be a good model. And I think it's Björn Andres who found out first that this is a good model for this uh, problem, which is called Connect Comics. And uh, I'm showing you here a really old uh, movie. Uh, um, but I think it has aged well because it, it shows you a little bit, you know, what, what this raw data looks like. So here, this is um, serial sectioning EM data. So serial sectioning electron microscopy data of the tiniest part of um, uh, human retina. And what we want to find out is um, where each neuron goes. And uh, at the time that we made this movie, which was in 2008, um, uh, CNNs were not around, and uh, you know it was the day of random forests and such. And uh, this is why, at the time, the biologists they uh, stained the sample in a very special way, um, so that uh, you would not see the interior of the cells, you would not see the organelles at all, you would only see the outline of those neurons. And uh, well, nowadays, uh, you know, with neural networks, of course, we find the insides of the cells, we find actually helpful and we're happy to, to have it. Yeah? Um, but you see that this is a very intricate uh, network, um, the, the neural pill of um, all these dendritic arbors of different uh, neurons uh, intermingled. And the, the goal in connectomics is to find out um, where each of these um, neurons goes and to which others it is connected and so on. So uh, um, you want to carve out, um, you know, not just one neuron at a time, but you want to carve out all at a time. And uh, well, it, uh, I have to say the, um, I've really enjoyed working on this uh, data for, for such a long time of my life because it's, um, I still find it very, very pretty. Um, so this was, uh, you know, the, the scale at which one would do these things in, uh, in 2008. And uh, uh, in 2020, um, this is now an image from uh, the Fly M team uh, at uh, Genelia Farm. Um, you can do this at the scale of uh, um, most parts of a fly brain. And uh, people are seriously working on <laughs> doing this on the smallest mammal that, that they can possibly find. And even for the smallest mammal that you can possibly find, you know, this is actually a lot of data and a lot of pixels, uh, which is uh, why actually, you know, it's a Google-esque kind of effort. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's Google together with FlyM, which produced this image on um, these, uh, I don't know how many trillion uh, voxels. No? So it's, it's uh, the problem is both difficult and it's also a very large problem, actually. And, uh, I don't understand much of biology, but, but it is actually quite humbling if you, uh, you know, at how much complexity um, there is, in, you know, in, in, a, in the brain of a fruit, fruit fly which sits on your banana, yeah? So it's, uh, it's uh, bananas. All right. So um, back to the modeling of this. Um, I here showed this pretty image, six pixels, um, some edges attractive. So I model this as an unsigned graph here uh, where I have an orange edge. It means it has a weight which is larger than zero. 
It does not want to be cut. Those pixels want to be together. They want to belong to the same object. Those pixels want to belong to the same object. And I have purple edges associated with edge weight smaller than zero. It means these pixels want to be in different objects. Well, and you know, if, if uh, you want to partition this graph, it is obvious how you would do it. Um, so the pixels that like each other, you put them in the same cluster. The pixels that don't like each other, you put them in different clusters and everybody's happy. Um, now, this becomes harder in real life because uh, unfortunately, there are often conflicting situations like so. Um, so what, what to do with this image here? Well, I've proposed here three different solutions. Um, on, on, so here I'm grouping into two regions, uh, but we have cut an attractive edge. So this is you know, not making everybody happy. It's not making this edge happy. Or we can group pixels like so, and now we're making this edge unhappy because those pixels really want to be together. Or we can group them all together and then we make the two repulsive edges unhappy and so on. And you can easily see that, especially as the, your image is larger and your number of conflicts is larger, you have this you know, exponential set of possible solutions. And uh, indeed, the problem is fundamentally combinatorial in nature. So, um, you know, it's not, not a smooth problem where you do a bit of gradient descent and you end up in a, in a global optimum. Uh, okay, when your networks also don't end up in global optima, but um, you know, it's really an enumeration kind of problem. And of, obviously there are smart ways of enumerating, and, you know, you're not going to brute force this, um, but it is fundamentally a hard problem. Um, so for people familiar with integer linear programming, um, this is how you can write it down. Um, this is your objective function here. We have the sum over all edges E, and then we multiply the weight associated with each edge with an indicator variable. The weights are given typically by your neural network estimated uh, you know, from the image. And um, these are what you want to fix. And <clears throat> um, well, these edge, <clears throat> edge indicators, you only allow them to be zero or one where one means I want to cut the edge, zero means I do not want to, um, to cut the edge. And if we only had this top line here and this bottom uh, line, you know, then it would be easy. We would just uh, you know, look at each edge and decide uh, to cut it or not. Problem is if we do this one edge at a time, we will get out inconsistent overall solutions. We're not going to get proper clusters out. And this is why we need something like the triangle inequality in addition. And uh, well, altogether, you know, with these integrality constraints here, it makes the whole problem non-convex and uh, you know, NP hard to solve. You you can solve small instances exactly, um, and you can solve larger instances pretty well, but no longer exactly. And uh, of course, in response, there has been you know uh, many algorithms. Uh, uh, wondering how to do that approximately. Um, one of the famous old ones is called Kernigan Lin, which was originally used out uh, to lay out uh, electronic devices. Um, then uh, our lab uh, developed a few um, of which for their problem domain uh, were the best, uh, at least uh, at the time. And uh, Björn Andres has kept working on this field and, and developed a very nice uh, suite of algorithms also. Um, a word on the modeling here. So um, given an input image uh, like so, um, we can ask for each pixel if or not um, it is part of the same uh, segment with this adjacent pixel. And uh, so if we have a ground truth partitioning of the image, then we can train a neural network um, to give us uh, this kind of prediction. So here, for example, I think we're actually asking for a virtual edge in this, uh, for a vertical edge in this image here. Or I can ask for a longer range and I will get a response like so. Or I can ask for a longer range in another direction, I will get a response like so. So at least if you have dense uh, ground truth, then you can very conveniently train a neural network to give you these bunch of uh, output images. And this bunch of output images are the weights that you're going to use in your graph partitioning problem. So um, summarizing part one here, 
Um, we've been talking about sine graphs, undirected graphs, where you have both positive, attractive, and negative, repulsive edge weights. Uh, I've argued that uh, such sine graph partitioning um, can model some of the most fundamental low level computer vision tasks. Um, I've also uh, tried to uh, say why, or, or I've sort of argued that uh, multi-cut is a natural objective if we want to formulate sine graph partitioning here. I've said that uh, solving exactly is very expensive and that there's a host of approximate solvers and um, that uh, CNNs, at least if you have uh, dense uh, ground truth, uh, um, CNNs or whatever, you know, uh, attention-based networks, they're good at estimating such attractive and repulsive interactions, which you can then use um, to model your low-level vision problems. Now, in the second part of the talk, um, I will talk about a very simple class of algorithms that does something useful on these sign graphs. But before I do, I wanted to ask if you have any questions at this point. Fabian is raising his hand. So I think Fabian, you can speak up. All right, yeah. So first of all, thank you so much. This has been a uh, fantastic lecture and uh, I've already learned so much. I was just uh, wondering a bit about uh, how, how robust that is. So if I'm thinking in terms of this uh, neuron segmentation problem, um, I could envision uh, a situation where neuron branches um, relatively far away, but two different dendrites or axons end up within proximity to each other. But then in that case, uh, the CNN that would be looking at the edge weights would uh, classify these two as belonging to separate objects and wanting the partitioning problem to separate them, whereas very far away, these two actually belong to the same problem. So can, is this something that can be uh, resolved robustly or does this cause errors in these types of approaches? Um, so let me try to see if I understood correctly what, what you're saying, um, especially when we um, estimate these uh, long range interactions here. I might um, look at uh, two pixels, which are some distance away, and there is lots of stuff going on in between, lots of boundaries. So it looks like they are from distinct objects. And yet, if I go a few microns or, or nanometers, so if, if I go a little bit on in the data, I see that actually they are merged, yes? And uh, yeah, of course, that is a fundamental conflict. And uh, so what you need is uh, that, uh, the transitive, we want to be together, wins against the direct, uh, we do not want to be together. And um, that is a uh, balancing question of how many, um, uh, you know, how many of the attractive interactions do you have and, and how many of the long range ones. And indeed, um, we use a sparse pattern of long range interactions. So um, we have, you know, here close by, um, we have uh, four immediate neighbors on the Cartesian lattice and uh, we're looking at all of them. But at a distance of 10 pixels, we have, you know, let's say of the order of 100 pixels, but we're only looking at, let's say 10 out of those. Yeah? And um, I think if one made a very bad choice here, um, then indeed, um, this uh, could cause problems. Um, that said, um, the I think the real problem, the, so where do really problems happen in this kind of data? Um, it's more because we're working a lot with boundary detection here. Um, when you have a mitochondrion, which is one type of cell organelle, which is uh, touching uh, a cell boundary, yeah? because the, the mitochondrion you want to ignore. And when you sort of when your neural network uh, you know, cuts out the mitochondrion, it may cut out also the cell wall to which the mitochondrion is attached. And then it may look like things are connected even though they are not. And um, the other kind of problem, now there are different uh, modalities on how to acquire these electron microscopy images. And um, 
I said zero sectioning earlier. Um, there's actually something called focused ion beam scanning, where you have um, practically isotropic resolution and absolutely amazing data quality. And then there is proper serial sectioning, where you take one image and then you uh, perhaps, uh, well, different techniques. You might either cut the layer and then image, or you might image and then cut. But anyway, um, they, they are bigger to produce, uh, and they're better to produce big field of view images, but they're also more prone to really uh, causing quite drastic artifacts. I like when we first cut off uh, a layer, which is only a few nanometers thick and then image it, it may always tear or you may lose one of these ultra, ultra thin slices or something uh, else might go wrong. And um, so um, actually these gross errors are the biggest problem now where you're continuing nicely or you're following a urine and then suddenly you are missing one or even more slices. And uh, this is where um, you need then really very long range context. And this is where, you know, not AI is needed, but, but where the most uh, amount of, let's say, you know, cleverness or understanding of the, of the data is needed. Klaus. Um, I don't hear you. Double mute, uh, classic. Uh, thank you very much Fred, for, for this first part of the talk. Um, I, I would be interested in, in how difficult it is to, to configure this solution. I mean, basically you have a learned part, the, the CNN part, and then you have the graph uh, part. And if you now consider variations of, uh, basically you could, you could apply different modality for imaging, or you could vary the problem uh, that you're basically trying to solve in the image, so how, how much expert knowledge do you need to, to then configure this interplay between what do I ask from the CNN and what, what do I actually do in, in, in the graph? And is, is that anything that can be automatically uh, yeah. optimized or is it something that you really need a lot of expert uh, knowledge in order to configure your weights and the interplay and, and all that? Yeah, so um, what I... Um... I think the um, so so with the with the kind of post processing or or the um, the method to to partition your lattice that I want to talk about in the second part, um, actually this has uh, let's say I think you have essentially one uh, hyperparameter in there, namely which uh, linkage criterion do I want to use. But I would claim that this is pretty much the only choice that you need to make uh, sort of arbitrarily. And so indeed, um, it means that you put most of the uh, modeling decisions then on the side of the neural network. And uh, there, in particular, I think the, the hardest decision is the one um, here with this uh, connectivity, which you know, also implicitly um, Fabian asked about. Um, so this uh, pattern of, um, what close range pixels and, and what long range uh, interactions do you want to measure? Yeah, so this determines, of course, um, the topology of, of your graph. Yeah, so here, for simplicity, I always only showed edges between adjacent pixels, but, but by these long range interactions, yeah, we have the, the long range ones. Um, and that's, I think, the more interesting choice than uh, asking, you know, in my unit, do I want the blocks to be residual or not, or you know, or do I do something transformer based? So, sort of all of the CNN part, you you can, uh, as you know, you know, completely, re, you know, plug and play, or, or, or let's say replace one by the other. Uh, and so, bottom line, the real modeling choice is in the connectivity here. Thanks for the good question. Um, any other questions? Amazing. I may add to, to the answer of Fred because I was also part of this research, Oli Kutte speaking. Um, yeah. Maybe you can update me on the latest incarnation. Um, so, I mean, the, the algorithm contains three, three major modules. First, the uh, neural networks to detect these membranes. Uh, and at the end, the graph partitioning algorithm, but in between, uh, there was a super pixel um, creation algorithm that uh, defined the graph. And yeah, I think this was the 
the part that required most uh, expert knowledge to get good super pixels and to uh, define the features of the super pixel edges. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, good question, Ulrich, and the answer is no longer. And this is the perfect introduction to my part two. <laughs> so, so, so maybe I should uh, start with part two now. Okay. <laughs> now that the questions get really clever. <laughs> um, thanks, wait, Ulrich. Wait, sorry, there's a, a, a question in the chat, uh, a basic yeah. one. <laughs> Uh, maybe you can look at it. All right. Um, the question is if the CNN is run per image or um, if it's a 3D CNN and, uh, and what ground truth exactly means. Um, so yes, we um, like to use um, 3D neural networks. Um, so even if, uh, so depending on the modality, your data may, the resolution of your data may not be isotropic. It may be much worse in, uh, in one dimension than in the other two, but still it's you know, obviously a good idea to use a 3D neural network. And um, a ground truth then means that, uh, you know, ideally you want a full partitioning. And uh, that is, um, you know, of course, a tremendous amount of work to generate. And uh, when I said uh, Google-esque, I meant uh, both the effort on the compute, but also the effort in generating the, the training data. Yeah? And now, of course, you can try and do clever things and learn from um, sparse uh, ground truth and so on. But it's not really something we focused on because dense ground truth was available for, all right. So, Dense ground truth was available for um, um, sufficiently large volumes uh, to train our neural networks. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'll um, go on to um, part two. Um, so now, um, yes, we have a neural network. Uh, we know how to estimate these edge weights, but now what do we do with the signed graph? And um, now I would like to um, talk about a family of algorithms, um, some old, some new, um, very simple algorithms, uh, namely uh, the ones that uh, come from agglomerative clustering. Um, I think uh, probably Thorsten Bayer was the, the first, at least in our lab, um, who figured that they could do something interesting. Um, but Alberto Bailoni, um, who is going to defend his PhD soon, has really looked uh, into this in much depth now. And uh, this is uh, essentially his work. Um, so first, uh, you know, what is this algorithm? If we focus here on the top left, um, we, ha we have a loop where we have some current set of segments. So SU and SV are segments uh, that are, belong to partitioning uh, pi here. Mm -hmm. And between each pair of segments, we uh, measure their interaction strength. Yeah? And uh, I will argue in a moment that how exactly we measure this interaction strength, that this is you know, absolutely crucial and uh, gives you very different behavior and accuracy and uh, performance and all. Yeah? Now, if this uh, biggest interaction, uh, if it is an attractive one, uh, then we merge these clusters. Uh, and then we update the interactions and that's it. And now I've omitted a few words. Uh, there is something with constraints uh, that if you want to know about in more detail, you should um, you know, read up in the, there's one preprint out, uh, which has half of the stuff that I'm showing here and we'll put out a new one in a few days with a lot more theory um, that Alberto has uh, worked on since. All right, now the linkage criteria are crucial. Yeah? So here's a tiny example, uh, cluster, another cluster, a couple of edges between the two. And uh, now how do you aggregate those interactions? And there are a couple of obvious choices. You know, so why not sum them up? And if we sum them, then here we have seven plus seven is 14, minus 10 is uh, a sum. If you sum them up, it gives you a strength of plus four. Or you could look at the single strongest interaction. And uh, that will give you a minus 10 here. And um, so coming back to Fabian Isensee's uh, question, so if we take this single strongest interaction, um, yeah, that may be 
perhaps more prone to provoking the kind of problem that he evoked, where you know a single strong repulsive interaction can overrule the many, many uh, attractive ones uh, that we do have. Um, or instead of sum, one could take the average. Um, so we had the sum was plus four, and we have four edges, so the average interaction strength is one. And uh, well, initially, I thought uh, that uh, sum or average, you know, would be pretty much the same thing, but but it, it uh, has very different behavior indeed. Uh, and then you can ask for the the biggest attractive or the, the biggest repulsive edge. And certainly you could ask for many others. Yeah? So this is already a family with five members. And uh, if we say, okay, we do or do not use cannot link constraints, uh, then this is uh, 10 members or nine because two of the members happen to be identical. Uh, you can invent other things here and uh, they may be meaningful, uh, like the felsenschwall putenloch algorithm, for example, is not uh, covered here, but already these five, um, okay, we understand them better than others, and we're already pretty happy with uh, the accuracy. Um, so just to show that uh, this innocuous uh, change, so going from the, you know, changing from the sum of interactions to the average of interactions, here's a, you know, just a toy example to show you that indeed this can give you different clusters. So here we have the same graph, and then. Well, you look for, uh, if we go to the sum part here, if we look for the strongest interaction, the strongest one here is plus seven. So these two are merged. <clears throat> we have a new node CD. And uh, now we look for the strongest interaction. We have plus eight, plus six, or minus 10. It's this plus eight. So these two are merged. And uh, at that point, um, we are left with only one more net interaction, which happens to be overall negative. Uh, so that's when we would stop the aggregation. And so you see this dendrogram here. And if you stop after the last uh, sort of attractive, net attractive interaction, you would cut here. So you've clustered A, C, D, and uh, B is in a separate cluster. If on the other hand, you use the average criterion, well, then you would have a cluster of CDB versus A, so a different result. All right. And um, so you can, uh, well, try this out for other uh, criteria, um, some of which are that I've mentioned earlier. And you can do this either on unsigned graphs or on signed graphs or on signed graphs also using cannot link constraints. And uh, well, then if you naively, you know, um, take the intersection of these, you get this whole uh, matrix or table of uh, algorithms. And um, some are, you know, really old school ones. So on, uh, on unsigned graphs, and this is what people have been doing since 1950 or so. Um, but on the signed graphs, uh, the literature becomes much more patchy. Yeah? Um, so the sum linkage is something that uh, Björn Andres and, uh, and Thorsten Bayer and Jörg Kappers uh, found at almost uh, the same time uh, independently. Um, and the mutex watershed, we published not long ago, uh, but it was Alberto understood that uh, this can also be understood as an agglomerative clustering algorithm. And so we have this, uh, these family members here and we can study them one by one. Uh, the mutex I've just mentioned uh, is a favorite one of mine. Uh, why? Because we understand it maybe best uh, of all of these. Um, so I have a, you know, this slide is just to show off, um, no time to explain it now, but we uh, understand in which limiting case this mutex watershed actually solves the multicut problem exactly. And uh, this is described in detail in a, in a PAMI paper from, from last year. All right. And uh, so the mutex watershed, we, we uh, I think uh, we invented and we studied, uh, but before understanding it's one instance of the agglomerative family. Uh, and then there are other algorithms, uh, which as far as we know, have not been studied previously on sign graphs. Um, with the exception of this uh, paper here um, that has come out a few months ago. And um, now, 
something that I don't have time to talk about in detail today is um, how uh, we can characterize them more theoretically. Um, so Alberto could prove that for this subclass shown here, um, these algorithms uh, define an ultrametric, uh, which normally is discussed on unsigned graphs and here generalized uh, to signed graphs. And this subclass of algorithms here have um, the property of shift invariance, which means that um, if you give me a sign graph, and if I then add any constant to all edges, for example, a positive constant large enough such that it makes all edges attractive, then, well, on sign graph, you have a natural stopping point, right? You always stop agglomerating when your net interaction becomes negative. But if you disregard this and went on clustering until you're left with a single cluster comprising all of your nodes, um, then here, this, these family members uh, framed here, um, they give you the same dendrogram, no matter what additive constant you use. And I think that has, um, I think that has some uh, deep consequences uh, in the sense that uh, these algorithms are probably, you know, less, uh, less novel than they first seem because uh, they would give you the same dendrogram as uh, their brethren uh, working on, on unsigned graphs. All right, now uh, I mentioned earlier how, how different the behavior is. So let's look at this, this same data. And I'm stopping here. So what we've seen is the aggregation. And uh, for example, um, this sum criterion has the uh, effect of, uh, or it, it tends to build one cluster at a time. So it builds one cluster and that one in the process becomes stronger and that sort of reinforces uh, the interactions, the positive interactions with its neighbors. And uh, then, you know, it's like on a lucky streak and uh, this cluster is built until completion and then the next one starts. On the other hand, look at this one here. Um, this is much more like, uh, you know, reminiscent maybe of what uh, Kruskal's algorithm would do in a minimum spending tree problem. It starts assembling these tiny fragments of clusters anywhere in the image. Yeah, and uh, on the right hand, so on the left hand side, we have what, uh, 10 segments. On the right hand side, we have what, 10,000 segments, you know, after the same number of merges. So extremely different behavior. And mutex here for this kind of graph is um, somewhere in between. And if we now let them all go on, well, given you know the, the nice outputs of our decent neural network, uh, they all come up with uh, with good and, and pretty similar um, segmentations. But what has what but what has happened in between was you know, extremely dissimilar. Yeah. So which one is best? <laughs> and have you to give you the frustrating lawyer's answer that it depends. It depends. All right, so uh, on pixel grid graphs, most of, in, you know, of, of biggest interest here to computer vision people, um, we find on average across the problems we've studied that uh, this average criterion gives us the highest accuracy. And uh, so then coming back to Klaus question, all right, you have your raw data, you have your, uh, maybe I should delete the C, uh, anyway, you have your neural network predictions. And then as long as you settle on, yeah, I want to use the average criterion, uh, then this has zero parameters and you get out your segmentation. Um, however, you could use the, <laughs> the mutex instead, instead, which is fastest, or um, you could use the sum criterion instead, uh, which uh, in our experience works best on dense graphs such as uh, social networks and so on. Yeah? So that's what I meant by the one hyperparameter that you do have is, do you want to use with some criterion or average criterion or this absolute maximum criterion? In principle, you have the choice of do you want to use the constraints or not? But um, so far in our experiments, we found that the constraints do not really help. So I would say the, the choice uh, really is between these three. And uh, well, the nice thing is, you know, all algorithms are, you know, 
it's extremely simple uh, and uh, not terribly expensive. Um, so you can just try them all. Yeah? And uh, now this, um, I have two results here on, so this ISB um, benchmark, it's really old. And it's on small data, um, but uh, literally hundreds of labs in the world have participated. And this is the current leaderboard. Um, so right now, um, the winner is um, a very nice new network called Patch Per Pix from Dagmar Keimler's lab. And, and she uses uh, Mutex Watershed on top of uh, her neural network predictions. And uh, this is what Alberto had. Um, this is a good, but, uh, but but normal uh, CCN and uh, again with uh, mutex watershed on top. Yeah? So both use the same uh, post-processing. Um, and uh, on the creamy challenge, um, this is a much bigger data set and more ground truth and it is harder, um, but a smaller number of labs have taken part in it. And again, there is the current leaderboard and uh, the uh, leader for quite a while now has been Konstantin Papa from Anna Kreshuk's lab, um, where he uses uh, highly engineered, um, so a good CNN, uh, our favorite super pixels, and then uh, the lifted multicut on top. And the next entries um, currently are Alberto uh, with the same CNN. And uh, importantly, uh, no super pixels, and then, uh, you know, these average algorithms, once with constraints, once uh, without constraints. And then, by the way, we can also run it, of course, on, the, on our favorite super pixels, but here they don't uh, even help. Yeah. So um, the uh, super pixels that we put a lot of, that Ulrich asked about, that we put a lot of love and effort into, um, they are now gone. Yeah. So we have the raw data, we have the choice of stencil, you have to choose your neural network architecture, obviously. But once you have those images here, you just run uh, your GASP with your favorite merging criterion and uh, no other parameters, which is something we really like. OK, so um, summary of that part. Uh, the GASP is a, is a family uh, of very simple agglomerative algorithms uh, for sign graphs, uh, which Alberto has now studied as a, as a family. And for instance segmentation and computer vision problems, um, we find that in most cases, average linkage gives you the highest accuracy. Um, but mutex watershed is the one that's fasted, uh, fastest. So empirically, this has a n log n. Uh, so not in theory, but, but empirically, we see an n log n scaling with problem size and it's still very, very good. Um, and uh, so my overall summary here is that both parts together, uh, sign graph partitioning uh, can be used to model a very broad range of uh, computer vision problems. And uh, no matter what progress there is on the neural network side, in the end, you always have this final you know, inference step where you need to cluster or aggregate or cut or whatever. Yeah, and this is um, the part uh, that I'm uh, interested in this talk here. And uh, simple agglomerative algorithms um, can be defined not only on unsigned graphs, but also on signed graphs. And we find that they do, that they do pretty well um, for these signed graph partitioning or clustering problems. Um, that's all. I'm looking forward to your questions. And if you're interested in any of these questions, then uh, you know, please reach out to me afterwards. Thank you very much. All right, questions. Well, thanks, Fred, for the really nice talk. Um, I have one question. Um, at the beginning, you distinguished two main types of, of algorithms, the detection-based one and the graph-based ones that you uh, presented. So how would, how would they relate, and why don't we see the detection ones on the leaderboards? Is it a matter of inductive bias and training data? or um, The reason is that um, the data is huge. Yeah? So these, um, these instances or these single neurons, they have a length of tens of thousands of pixels. And um, so the mask, RCNN and so on kind of family, 
they were great when your objects, let's say your car or your pedestrian or whatever, when it fits into the field of view of your neural network. Yeah, because the important thing, of course, for the detection-based ones is to make precisely one detection per object. Now here, um, and, and how do you do that on the cars and pedestrians? Well, you feed in your image at a couple of scales. And if you downsample enough, um, your car will fit into, or even your, your truck will fit into the field of view. If you downsample this enough, um, you know, each single neuron will completely, utterly, you know, will just be gone. Yeah? The only thing you're left with are, uh, you know, uh, the cell buddies. And uh, I mean, yes, you could argue uh, then, right, then we have one seed or one detection per cell body, and then we want to propagate from there, um, which works as long as you have all cell buddies in your field of view, which is uh, usually not the case in, uh, in connectomics. Um, so there are uh, good reasons why the detection-based ones must fail on these uh, kinds of data where you have very, very long, but not very thick objects. And uh, to be clear, I mean, if I, um, if I had to, uh, you know, work with these, um, and if I want something out of the box, um, yeah, I probably use, uh, you know, one of the detection-based methods. Okay, thanks. That's very interesting. Um, Wally is raising his hand. Yeah. Um... Uh, I think I missed it in the talk. Um, so usually um, the output of a CNN is a response per pixel. So like membrane strengths per pixel. But for your algorithm, you need edge weights. Do you transform the pixel responses of the network to edge weights in the graph? Or do you learn edge weights directly in the CNN? Um, the edge weights are learned directly. Yeah. So um, the ground truth image, um, you can, uh, let's see, I don't have the picture here. I think uh, the, um, the ground truth, you can uh, translate into images by asking you know, these two pixels at a distance of 10, um, are they in the same segment or not? And you do that. Uh, for each pair of pixels at a distance of 10 in the horizontal direction, let's say. Um, so you get out a binary image. And uh, this is what you use as, as ground truth directly. So I would say you're learning edge weights directly. So like in the mutex watershed paper. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think Lena has a question. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a raise hand, but, but I'm as co-host. Uh, um, yeah, uh, many thanks, Fred. I have a meta science question. So you showed all these rankings from the challenges, uh, and you basically described the methods by uh, X plus Y plus Z, you know, core method, post-processing, etc. cetera. Um, how, how do you decide what what makes a winner the winner? So, I mean, how do you decide which component components were crucial, which you would want to adapt compared to what didn't make a difference? Yeah, it's. I think it's pretty uh, clean here because in this case, it's two different neural networks, but it's the same post-processing. So, mutex watershed in both cases. Um, here, um, this neural network is the same as that neural network and as that neural network because uh, you know, we were very friendly uh, with Konstantin and Anna's lab. Um, so we know it's the same neural network and um, <clears throat> that uh, all differences in performance then come from the choice of post-processing. Yeah, I, I mean, I see it in this case, but do you have a, do you have a general strategy? I'm just interested because- I Oh. <laughs> 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 um, no, I don't. Um, I think the general observation is that um, you know, you're not going to save a bad neural network with a fancy output and uh, vice versa with a great neural network, um, you will be able to get something reasonable with a very simplistic inference or post-processing. And I think the, the trend of 
um, of recent years is that we, um, so I'm, I'm thinking of tracking now, which um, is always on my mind, even though we don't work on it all that much. Um, so for example, in tracking, you could have um, pretty simple uh, or pretty weak priors of what should be assigned to what, and then you could do a very fancy afterwards uh, conflict resolution uh, inference and so on. Or you could try and you know, give the neural network more space, time, context, and, uh, and then maybe even train it end to end with a very simple post-processing. And I think given enough training data, this latter strategy um, will win. I'm not sure if that is your question, Lena. Well, that was also interesting. I uh, <laughs> I was a bit more general, and yeah, I find I just find it so hard that uh, basically papers basically publish uh, a whole pipeline, and then I, I always wonder what what really what really makes makes a method perform uh, well. But it, uh, it's a hard problem. But you gave a specific answer to a specific problem, so this is also interesting. <laughs> I, I think Klaus has an answer. <laughs> No answer. Sorry. <laughs> okay, then, then, let me just, then let me just you know uh, answer quickly. I mean, uh, when you say good paper of a good paper, of course I expect a decent lesion study, uh, but by this uh, but by this criterion, many papers are not good. Of course. <laughs> All right, Klaus. Yeah, just um, maybe similar direction, but uh, a little different. So maybe you could provide me with an intuition how, how difficult it is to come up with that Kremi score here. So how, I mean, you always have to ask yourself, okay, what, what is a, a metric that in the end represents a really uh, nice result? And is, is it easy in this case to, to measure that? Because I mean, I, I know in other areas we are really discussing hard on how to measure success. Now, this is also um, one area where this is discussed a lot and where what you, uh, where it is not obvious what is the right thing uh, to do. Um, now, Kremi is something simple. It's whatever, uh, you know, it's a split score plus the merge score, you know, some, something simple and it's, uh, and it's in the repo open source. So you can, you know, you can reproduce and you can understand what it does. Um, but uh, some people, um, here in this uh, field in particular, they have been developing other scores that um, try and look more at the number of topological errors um, or, um, and you know, sometimes they were more or less principled. Um, I think they all have, uh, uh, you know, they all have a point, they all have merit uh, and the community has not really settled on any single one of them. Yeah, so I would say uh, unsolved problem mm -hmm. in short. Probably if it also depends on the scientific question that you want to ask later on the data, so like the biological question. So for example, you could measure how many synapses are wrongly assigned to the wrong neuron or um, whether you have uh, get the correct subnetworks or whatever, right? One minute left. Final I, I have one more question. Yes. And when we participated in in Kremi, we were uh, one one big difference that we found was that the annotations are really sparse and really only available on very few images. Is that something that's being addressed in the community at the moment? That's like also trying to come up with more labels and more dense dense labels? Um, so the Hemi brain, uh, which I cited earlier, um, they have made the, uh, um, the Google segmentation available. Um, so you can, with an API and all, yeah, so you can get, uh, you can stream terabytes and terabytes of um, not flawless, but pretty good segmentations um, that you could learn from. Um, I, I think a few years back, um, this is where um, Google and us sort of bifurcated. Uh, so so um, this is Vera and Jane's team here. Um, one of the first um, things his team did uh, when it was established was um, to um, collect all the training data 
from all the different modalities and all the different labs. You know, there were bits and pieces of training data out there in the world, freely accessible. Um, and of course, it was a good idea um, to bring it all together um, to train, you know, to let the neural network, uh, you know, well, learn from them all. Yeah? And uh, it's completely meaningful and the right thing to do. And um, it's something that we did not do um, because I'm not so interested in, in this. Yeah? Ultimately, I am more interested in methods. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, you know, it's nice to win benchmarks. Um, but um, I wasn't really, really interested in pushing it, you know, the uh, sort of all the way in the industrial, um, you know, sort of in, in the big scale and so on. And unfortunately, um, this, uh, this uh, flood filling uh, algorithm, um, which the Hemi Brain team has used, um, uh, has not been evaluated on these public benchmarks. Yeah, so we think the uh, accuracy is probably about the same. Um, but uh, again, what I said earlier, I mean, if you put more training data and you know, make your network deeper and so on, this will always help. Yeah? Um, so that's the right thing to do. Um, just scientifically, I don't find that part so, so appealing. Yeah? So I'm uh, more interested in, uh, yeah, what can we do on the inference side? Or um, on the neural network side, um, we are interested. So, so a few years back, uh, we uh, 2018, we, we published one of the first papers on uh, a steerable neural network. Um, so on equivariance in networks. And nowadays, we're using that to um, think about, uh, you know, can we use that to uh, address uh, quantum chemical problems, uh, such equivariant networks? Um, so I, yeah, somehow I like this uh, conceptual things more. Cool. Yeah, sounds interesting. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, I think there, there are no more uh, questions. So I think I hand hand back to Lena and Doreen. Yeah, thanks to you all, especially to our speaker today. And also for the interactive discussion. It was quite fun to listen. And yeah, for more data science videos, you can join our YouTube channel and also look for the new announcements on our website of the data science seminar and also for Heidelberg AI. So thanks for watching and listening and goodbye to you all.